This is what I'm worried about. I'm worried about influenza. Honestly, for my $5 bet, I think this is the next one. I think we've not heard the end of influenza yet, and I think it's going to come back sooner or later. It's a matter of time, and I think when it does, it's going to be horrifying. That's why I'm interested in flu. I'm interested in flu because I think it's got important lessons for us today. Even though the example we're going to use is 100 years old. So, influenza caused by a virus, right? Please don't ask your doctor for antibiotics if you have the flu, although most people do. Uh, the family of influenza it comes from the orthomyxovirus family. Who, uh, there are three different uh, genuses, geni, uh, genera. Sorry, there are three genera. God, Latin, again, should have taken more Latin. There are three genera of uh, influenza families, A, B, and C. Mostly A is the one we worry about. Causes the seasonal flus, the flus that, that we talk about. B and C happen. They also infect other weird stuff. Like I think B, only humans and seals get that for some reason. <laughs> C affects, you know, other stuff. We know that, that many mammals are susceptible to influenza and we know that it is zoonotic generally. There are plenty of animal reservoirs of the different families, different species I should say, of influenza. Of particular importance for humans we usually talk about birds and pigs, right? Swine flu and poultry of various types. How do you get uh, the flu? Well, fluid contact or droplet contact depends sort of species to species, some more aggressive or more contagious than others. Interestingly, not sexually transmitted. The name, and you guys have probably all heard this, you've heard of like H1N1, H5, H7N9 we now have. Where do all the H's and N's come from? Well, this is interesting. Because flu is so damn busy, if you could look at the mutation rate of influenza, it would horrify you. It diversifies super fast, and it in fact diversifies faster than HIV. We've seen how quickly HIV radiates, right? Into one and two, into group M, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then recombinant types and so on. Influenza puts that one to shame, and the graphs that you look at, how quickly they branch out are, are quite shocking. So, makes bad copies of itself, in other words. Mutates often and fast. So in order to name it, we name it based on two things, and these are surface proteins. And when it's got antigens to either of these, then we label them accordingly. The first is hemagglutinin, and the second is neuraminidase. You take a look at the surface of that virus under the microscope, you say, ah, what kind of hemagglutinin and what kind of neuraminidase antigens does it have on the top of it? Oh, it's got H1 type. And what about the N type? Ah, that appears to be 5. Then you've got H1N5 influenza. Does that make sense? That's your H and N. Our historical example is going to surprise you, I suspect. Most of us think of the flu as something that sort of is a bit of a pain and gives us a week off work or school. The last big epidemic of H1N1, well, I won't say the last, there have been many others, but the biggest epidemic of H1N1 occurred in 1918. What was ending in 1918, historians? The First World War. That's right. The first industrial scale war, the first global war, involved soldiers moving all over the planet, involved sort of industrial age technology for the first time, the assembly line war. Thank you, Henry Ford, right? So, between early 1918, that's January of 1918, and December of 1920, so all of two years, hey, well, or, or I suppose. A single virus, single version of that virus, H1N1, infected something like half a billion people at a time, remember, when the population of planet Earth was substantially smaller than it is now, and killed between 50 and 100 million of them. So, think again. How many people have been killed by HIV in all human history? 30 million, something like that, 35? another 35 or something infected, round up, say 50 million. How long has HIV been around? Oldest preserved human tissue is ZR59, right? Our friend Jacques Pepin thinks maybe it turned up a little earlier than that in Cameroon, very first person, 1920s, right? Something like that. 
So in the century that HIV has had here on planet Earth, it's managed about 20 million. In the space of a couple of years, flu managed 100 million. Before airplane travel, right? No big mass vaccination campaigns like HIV had. This is shocking stuff. This is the flu killing 100 million people in the space of a few years. A bad week of this epidemic was like a bad year for Ebola, okay? Shocking, shocking how fatal this disease was. How this flu killed people is interesting, compelling to us. It kills with what's known as a cytokine storm. Has anybody heard of this? It's a very dramatic name. It sounds kind of glamorous, it's less in practice. Cytokines are what? They detect infection, basically, right? Immune cells. They're the ones that are swimming around and realize, ah, something is amiss. There's a virus here who does not belong. They invite T cells to come to the party and kick up a fuss. What happens is that when those T cells arrive, they're also activated, they activate more cytokines, and so you get a positive feedback loop where the immune response accelerates itself. And so essentially you keep kicking up a stronger and stronger immune response. Doctors in the room know immune response in a nutshell is just pus and swelling. You know? A bunch of inflammation and a bunch of goober. Right? That's your body trying to clear things out, cook out the problem. And so one of the primary causes of death of people during the H1N1 influenza epidemic of 1918 to 1920 was essentially drowning. Why? Why did they drown? Because their lungs filled up yeah, with lymph fluid, with pus. People would drown in their own lungs because the immune response was so intense this virus was able to provoke a massive, massive immune response, right? What's especially interesting to us is to consider who died during this epidemic. The shape of the mortality profile. Who in the average sort of human population has the healthiest immune system? It's the sort of 18 to 45s or something, right? You guys are in rude health. You're all robust. That's who is by far the most likely to die during this flu pandemic. People in the prime of their lives. She's quite curious. This permanently dented the population of some countries. Huge proportions of people died. But generally speaking, the very young and the very old made it out okay. Two theories about this. One, the very young or the very old are less likely to pitch up as intense a cytokine storm, right? Their machinery is not as robust as you guys. So even when their little feeble immune systems fight their very hardest, they're not, not fighting that hard. The second theory is that it was just bad timing. That it was unlucky for people who happen to be in your age group because there had been seasonal flu epidemics very similar to this one that had happened before. One had happened fairly recently and one had happened a generation and a half ago and if you'd been exposed to either of those flu epidemics, then you'd still be carrying some antibodies. And so perhaps, if you were a few years old and caught a little baby flu, then you'd be protected against the next one. Or if you were 60 years old and you had had that flu way back in, help me with the math there, 1860 or something, 1858, then you would still carry some protection. Yes, so let's talk about that. What would the war have to do with the influenza pandemic? That's right. So wars are great big machines for chewing up young people. That's basically what wars are. That's why 60-year-olds don't fight. You guys do, right? So, lots and lots of young people crisscrossing the world on steamships, living together in camps. The current guess is that actually the 1918 influenza starts in an army camp in the United States where thousands of guys are sleeping in tents and shining their boots and getting ready to get shipped off to war. Lots of upheaval with the war. Remember we spoke about refugees, people moving around, infrastructure being busted up, and about great big flows of people. We're now able to put 6,000 people on a great big steamship and send them across to France to go fight. This is really the first time in history that we've been able to do that and do it so quickly. 
flu really, this 1918 pandemic, really starts looking like the first globalization disease. There was almost no corner of the earth that's unaffected. We've dug up all sorts of corpses in, in graveyards in Alaska. People in the South Pacific, Tahiti, Vanuatu, these countries were clobbered by the influenza. Right. Spread all over. So movement, absolutely. People cramped together in close quarters, absolutely. And then the shattering of the infrastructure that would have responded best to this in peacetime. 1918 is the end of the war, not the beginning. People are toast by 1918. They're tired, they're worn out, lots of dead. Very few skilled people left. Right? So, influenza manages to sort of pounce on all of these things all at once. The last thing that I'd like to mention, and this is a neat sort of historical point, is that it's sometimes called the Spanish flu. Have you heard that? The Spanish flu. Why do we call it the Spanish flu? It started in America, right? The war was still going on in 1918 and nobody wanted to report that there were people dying in their own country. America absolutely didn't want to put death figures on the front page of the New York Times, right? Because the Germans might read it or the Prussians or whatever. <laughs> uh, the Kaiser uh, might read it. Similarly, you didn't want to publish death stats about your enemy because if you got it wrong, Right? You could reveal a tactical advantage that they had over you. You might give away the location of your spies who were trying to get those numbers or something. So nobody who was involved in the war wanted to give away their statistics about the flu. Who was neutral in World War I? Spain. Also, the king of Spain got a little bit sick with the flu himself. He did not die. And so, everybody was happy to publish Spain's death statistics because <laughs> they were neutral. So Spain becomes this very convenient scapegoat. Everybody could blame it on the damn Spanish. Who did the Spanish blame it on? The Italians. That's your history lesson for now. People never change. But I think this illustrates the sort of Rudolf Virchow point. We remember him from week number one. The medical is always political, folks. It's never not political. 